When did Jesus' story move from being a Jewish story to a Gentile story? Ever wonder that? Well, today we find out. Welcome to Through the Bible, where our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, escorts us through an important transition when the gospel moves from Jerusalem to the world. We're on a five-year journey through the whole Word of God. We're studying now the fifth gospel, as some affectionately call the book of Acts. You know, if I had to name just one thing that our study in Acts is teaching us is that we're all so human. The personal drama is written between every line. Take this study in Acts chapters 9 and 10, for example. We meet Cornelius, a good man, a Gentile, and a captain in the Roman legion. Cornelius fears God and lives a moral, generous life, but he doesn't yet know God. And then God chooses Peter, likely one of the strongest Jews you could meet in the day, a man of strong values and personality. You remember the stories to introduce Cornelius to Jesus. Unless God told him to, Peter would never have set foot inside a Gentile home. So how is God going to get these two men together? Well, we'll find out today in our study, and it's a good one. Let's pray as we open the word. Father, thank you that you're in the business of saving us from our sinful lives, bringing us into the light and making us your children. We ask that you would bring even more to yourself today. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we've been a long time in this ninth chapter of Acts, but it's a very important one. We have here the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and we've already seen that, which is quite remarkable. Then we pick up the story of Simon Peter again, and we'll have him in the remainder of this chapter, and then on into the tenth chapter and then the ministry of Simon Peter is largely not followed anymore. We'll pick up then the ministry of Paul the Apostle. So that now we are talking about this man, Simon Peter, the Apostle, that is used of God. Now I want to again remind you that he has gone down from Lydda to Joppa. They have sent word to him that a very wonderful woman in the church there in Joppa by the name of Dorcas has died. They apparently felt Simon Peter could raise her from the dead. At least they asked him to come down. Verse 39, then Peter rose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. Now, you'll notice it was the widows that conducted this fashion show. They all were showing off the garments that she made. And why did the widows do it? Well, they were poor. They wouldn't have had any clothes if it hadn't have been for Dorcas. She was the one that sewed for them. And this was her ministry. This was actually a gift of the Holy Spirit. And it was very important. Now, verse 40, but Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. Now, here is the exercise of a sign gift. We have in the book of Acts, the historical book of the church, we have the ministry of Simon Peter, an apostle, and of Paul, an apostle. One, a minister to his own people, Simon Peter, and yet he's going to open the door to the Gentiles. Then we have Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the apostle, and he went to the Gentiles. Now, both of them, we have an instance of both of them raising the dead. It's quite possible they raised others from the dead, but this is the only record, and it's given to us to show that these men had these sign gifts. Now, they could perform miracles. They could heal the sick. They could raise the dead. These were the marks. These were the evidences of an apostle in that day. And they were apostolic gifts. They were the foundation, Paul says, of the church. They are not the foundation in the sense that the church is built on them, but they are the ones who put down the New Testament on which the church is actually built today. Now, we've come to the period where we don't need signed gifts. Signed gifts prove they were apostles. Signed gifts today are not in existence. 
and they wouldn't prove anything. The important thing today is whether you have the doctrine or not. John wrote probably his last book was one of the epistles he wrote, and he said, if any come to you having not this doctrine, receive him not. Now, I didn't say whether he had sign gifts. Apparently, even then, they were not in evidence. And toward the end of the ministry of Paul, I can show you very definitely, Paul did not exercise the gift of healing, and he had that gift, you must recall. He was an apostle. So that the emphasis now comes to the Word of God, and it comes to the person of Jesus Christ. But now, this establishes, again, the apostleship of Simon Peter. And so the church is amazed. Verse 42, it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Now it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Now the tanner, you know, took skins and put them in acid, and it made it rather odoriferous. When I was in Joppa, they show you a house that was the place where Simon Peter stayed and the roof there and all that. It could well be it's a rather picturesque village there right on the water's edge, and this house was right down there. could well have been the place because the house looks like it's been there about that long, and this is the place where Simon Peter was staying. Now that brings us to the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, and we have now the conversion of Cornelius, a Roman centurion, who's a son of Japheth. Now let's look at this. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now, you'll recall that up through this area, Paul had gone and the apostles had gone preaching the gospel up the coast. And you go from Joppa, you go up from there. Well, Tel Aviv is really a part of old Joppa. And then you come on up and the next place would be Caesarea that is, of any size. And so there was a centurion in Caesarea. Now, that's the place where Pilate stayed. It was really a Roman city. It was built there, and the governor and those who rule that land stayed there. Now, this man, Cornelius, is a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Now, we're told certain things about him here. He was a devout man. That's first. That means his worship was rightly directed. He had a recognition of a dependence upon that which was divine. Now, to him, it was God's. He was a pagan. And he had a devotion and a deep conviction. That could well be true, you see, of a pagan. You sometimes wish some Christians today had more devotion and conviction. Now, the second thing is said here, a devout man and one that feared God. Now, that means that he was not a proselyte in the strict sense of the term. He would be called that one of the gate. That is, we would say today, he's a man that lives in the neighborhood that attends the church on Easter Sunday and at Christmas time. He is one that is friendly toward the church, but he's not a Christian. This would be this man here. He feared God. Now, the third thing, it says, he gave much alms to the people. Now, he gave much alms. And the nation Israel has always laid great stress upon giving. God had taught them that, you see, back in the Old Testament. Instead of, by the way, giving a tenth, a tithe, I think it's obvious from the Mosaic system that they gave three tenths. You see, they gave for the running of the government because it was a theocracy at the beginning. Then they gave to the temple. Then they gave a tenth of everything that they produced so that they have been a generous people. And many of these elemosinary foundations today, charitable foundations today, were established by Jews, by the way. And there's no people that are giving today as this nation is giving to the nation of Israel. They are very generous in that connection. You remember the Lord Jesus said to this young man, sell what you have, give to the poor, follow me. You see, the riches of that young man was standing in his way of coming to God, even under the Mosaic system. He could say, I keep the law. He didn't do this and he didn't do the other thing, but he failed to do the thing that he should have done even under the law. And that blocked the way. 
And he'd have to get over that hurdle before he could come to Christ, you see. And a great many folk today put something ahead of Christ. It doesn't necessarily have to be riches. And it can be a business. It can be a sin. It can be a habit. It can be actually a loved one that we put ahead. Now, the fourth thing that is said about Cornelius, he prayed to God. Now, he took his needs to God. He needed to have more light. He just didn't have light, but he prayed. But he didn't know much about prayer, by the way. Now, will you notice what is said about this man? He prayed to God always. And verse 3, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and this man is a man of influence, you see. We'll see later that he had a tremendous influence on his own household. Well, he's an officer in the Roman army, a career officer, and the influence of the man must have been tremendous. Now, he was a good man. To all outward features, he'd pass as a Christian today, a Christian of the highest degree, an outstanding man. But he actually was not a Christian. He's an example of a man who lived up to the light that he had. Now, you'll remember in John 1, 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, this man had never come into the presence of Christ, but what he had, why he had lived up to it. And you remember Paul in writing to the Romans, he had something to say into this connection. That which may be known of God is manifest in them. God hath showed it unto them, the invisible things. He recognized there was a God, but he didn't know him. Actually, he didn't come up to the light that he had. Somebody says, what was the problem then? Well, this man did come up to all the light that was given to him. He seemed to measure up. Now, this man is God's answer to the oft-repeated question. What about the poor pagan and the good heathen who wants to know God? Never had a chance. Is he lost? The answer to that is God will get light to him. God will enable him to hear the gospel. You wouldn't be apt to find a good heathen, but this man here certainly measures up because we're told that they're none good. Now, how could God get the gospel to Cornelius? There were insurmountable barriers. The church at this time was entirely Israelite. And for the first eight years, it was exclusively that. Paul had said to the Jew first, and it had gone to him chronologically first. Now, the Christians went to the temple. They still observed many Jewish customs. Under grace, they could do that. They were trusting Christ. Now, when the gospel broke over into Samaria, Jerusalem was surprised, but recognized the hand of God. Now, how can the door of the gospel be thrown open to Gentiles? Well, isn't Paul going to be the apostle to the Gentiles? There's no plan of the church to go to the Gentiles. While God was training Paul in the desert of Arabia, God sent Simon Peter to open the door to the Gentiles, and he used the most prejudiced and religious bigot and extremist of that day that you can imagine. Here is a detailed and complicated system, and it must be worked out, and therefore it's entirely the supervision of the Holy Spirit. Now, only genuine Christian work, friends, directed by the Holy Spirit. None other work amounts to anything. Now, will you notice this man, Cornelius, he was praying. He was not dreaming. He was praying, given a vision. And he dispatches messengers down the coast from Caesarea. It wasn't but a few miles down to Joppa. And the Spirit of God now is going to prepare another man, a human instrument. Now, notice, when he looked on him, Verse 4, that is, upon this vision, this man, that came to him. What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now, I'd have you note that there are certain things that do count before God. There are no merit for salvation, but God took note of them. And because the man did that, he got the gospel to this man. And I believe today that if there's any man anywhere 
that can come up, Cornelius, religious-wise, he's going to hear the gospel of the grace of God. God will see that he gets it. Now, will you notice, and now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And they told him to go to the tanner's house. And the odor from those hides down in that vat, I'm telling you, they had no problem finding the tanner's house in that day. Now when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And now God's going to prepare Simon Peter. These men are not going to have any trouble finding the place. Verse 9, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now God's going to have to prepare Simon Peter and we'll see that it was necessary. Simon Peter did not have the breadth that Paul had. He did not have the background. He didn't have the training at all. But you see, God can use man differently. And this idea today that everybody has to be poured into the same mold for God to use them is, I think, a tremendous mistake. Now, will you notice the thing that's happening the Spirit of God now is going to prepare Simon Peter. He's prepared Cornelius now to hear. And on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Now, he went up about the sixth hour to pray, became very hungry, would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. Now, this is the thing that there were beasts and there were all kinds of birds and all kinds of bugs. And the Lord tells to him, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Now, he's wondering what that means. Because notice what Peter said. But Peter said, not so, Lord. Isn't it interesting? He calls him Lord, and he doesn't really obey him. He says no, but he calls him Lord. For I have never eaten anything that's common or unclean. Now, don't miss that. Here is a man that's now on this side of the day of Pentecost. And he's living in a day when whether you eat meat or you don't eat meat, makes no difference, and he's not eating meat. He would not eat any of these things at all that were unclean, listed in the Mosaic system. Now, when he said that, he's sincere and he's honest about it. And somebody says, well, he ought to be broad-minded and eat everything, eat what's set before you, Paul said. Well, may I say to you, under grace, if you don't want to eat, you don't have to. And if you want to eat, you can the trouble about a great many people today is they say, well, I'm going to follow the same procedure. I'm not going to eat. But they try to put everybody else under it. My friend, under grace, you can eat meat or not eat meat. That's your business, under grace. Just the way God leads you about matters like this, because after all, these things won't bring you to the Lord. They may give you indigestion if you eat certain things, but it certainly won't bring you to the Lord nor interfere with your relationship with him. Now the voice spoke unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. He says to Simon Peter, What God's called clean, don't you call it unclean. You can eat anything here. God's told you to do that. And now notice what happens. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again unto heaven. Now this man is wondering what it's all about here. Now verse 17. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the man which was sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and they stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now Simon Peter 
is to go to Caesarea, asking no questions. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What's the cause whereof ye are come? And now they give the explanation. They said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear of thee. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now there's quite a little delegation going up. Now will you notice, and the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. You see, he had quite a bit of influence, and he wanted his friends and his relatives to share in this. And so he went in, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. You see, Cornelius is a pagan. He's heathen. <laughs> He's told to send for this man, so my, he must be somebody. And so he falls down to worship Simon Peter. Now, notice what Peter said. This is interesting, friend. Simon Peter would never have let you kiss his big toe, I'll tell you that. He just wouldn't permit it. Listen to this. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself also am a man. I'm just a man. Peter reached down and lifted him up, you see. And he said, stand up. I'm a man. I like the way he did that. Now, notice what he does here in Caesarea. And he broke, actually, the first rule of homiletics in his message. He offers an apology. Will you notice this, what he says here? And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. Simon Peter still doesn't quite understand, and he's at the home of a Gentile. Listen to him now. He said unto them, Ye know how that it is unlawful thing for a man that's a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Now, friends, that's not a nice way to begin a message. That's not very friendly. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. My friend... That is an insult. Simon Peter says, if you really want to know how I felt about this, well, I didn't want to come. I've never been in the home of a Gentile before, and I just haven't been in where it's unclean. <laughs> May I say to you, those of you that are housekeepers, have a home, suppose you have a vista, and the vista comes in and says, my, what a dirty house you have. May I say to you, you wouldn't feel very friendly to that individual. That's, in substance, what Simon Peter is saying at this particular time. What a tremendous thing it is. Now we're going to hear his message, but we're going to have to wait till next time to do that. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, as always, God is at work in Peter, changing his attitude toward Gentiles. And then God uses him to lead Cornelius to saving faith in Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful story, but it's a beautiful story every time God saves one of us from our sins, isn't it? I love the fact that in a day yet future for Peter, he would write in 1 Peter 2.9 about everyone who comes to Jesus. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's great, isn't it? You know, God is bringing people to himself gathered from every tribe, tongue, and nation, from every generation and from every demographic. And as we partner together in taking the whole word to the whole world, we get to be a part of this amazing story, and we invite you as well to be a part of it. You can visit ttb.org forward slash pray to do that. And if you'd like to be a part of carrying the mission forward, go to ttb.org forward slash give or call 1-800-65-BIBLE anytime. Carlene in Watuga, Texas, recently told us how much it means to her to share in this work. Here's her correspondence with us. This is the first time on the Bible bus for me and my two sisters. We are all in different places in the U.S. and don't listen at the same time, but we do discuss our journey with each other. We also invite others to join us. I'm donating so the Bible bus can get new wiper blades and have the windows cleaned. 
We all need to see clearly where the Lord is taking us and what He is teaching us in His Word. I always tell my sisters, you can find me sitting on the wheel wells over the back tires, a place I used to sit on the school bus back in the days of my youth. Please pray for our families as we travel through God's holy word. God bless everyone on the Bible bus. Well, Charlene, I've never heard the illustration of buying wiper blades for the windshield. I love that. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you back here for the journey next time. Jesus made it Through the Bible is a five-year study of God's entire Word, and together we discover God's purposes in history and our lives, found only when we believe in Jesus Christ. Do you know Him yet?